Hey, this is Marvin and today I will show you how to create a simple 2D snake in Unity which will look like the one you can see in the video. The project files are hosted on GitHub and you can find the link to GitHub in the description. Let's dive into it and hope you will learn some new stuff. The first thing we want to do is create a new Unity project. Because the project is in 2D, we choose a 2D template here. Just click on create and wait some time. I just cut it out something here, so you don't have to wait for it. Because all in our game should consist out of blocks, we want to create one block first. To do so, we select from the menu at the top, game object, 3D object, and then cube. And we also want to change the scale of the cube and make it a bit smaller. Here we just set the scale to 0.9 for each component. And because we want to have a snake with a head and a tail with different colors, we create two materials, one for the head and one for the tail, and assign some colors to the materials. When we switch to the game view, we can see that the cube we created is pretty gray or dark and so what we want to do is we want to add a directional light to the scene and increase the intensity of the light a little bit so the whole scene gets illuminated properly. Now we are going to write some code. To do so we need to create a C-sharp script in Unity and we call it Snake. Then we need to open the project with a code editor. I use Visual Studio Code but you can use whatever editor you prefer. We first want to create some public variables, which we also can access from the Unity editor and not only from inside the script. We want to make the grid size adjustable so we can create a variable called x size and y size, which defines the size of the game grid. And we also create a game object variable for the cube or block we already created in Unity. At the beginning of our game, we want to create a border around the game grid. We want to do that in a method called createGrid, which we call in the start method, which is executed when the Unity game starts. We want to make this method private, because we only need to call it from this script and from no other script. Inside of this method, we create a for loop and iterate over x size. Then, for every x from 0 up to x size, we want to create a border tile. We can clone our block game object by using Unity's instantiate method and after that we want to assign the position of this tile properly. I think determining the position is the most difficult part of this small project and so I prepared a small video to make it a little bit more clear what we do here. So I'm trying to make a little bit more clear with this small drawing. Let's say we have x size equal to 10 and y size equal to 10. And then we have our center point here at 0, 0, and what we want to do is we want to determine the position of all those border tiles here. For the y component, we simply can go downwards by y size divided by two steps. We have y size is equal to 10, so we do 10 divided by 2, which gives us 5. So we are going downwards 5 steps. And for the x component, we are iterating from 0 to 10, and then we do for each value x minus x size divided by 2. Let's say we have x is equal to 0, then we do 0 minus 10 divided by 2, which is minus 5, which gave us this coordinates here on the left side of the bottom border. And let's say we put x equal to 10 into this equation, then we have 10 minus 10 divided by 2, which is 5, and that gives us that coordinates here, so the right side of the bottom border. We also want to have a border at the top for sure, so we do the same thing we have done with the bottom border and change the position accordingly. Because we want to go from left to the right, the same way we also have done for the bottom border, our x coordinate remains at x minus x size divided by 2. For our y component, we want to go upwards by y size. So our new y component is y size minus y size divided by 2. We also want to have a border at the left and the right side. So we will create another for loop, iterate over a variable called y, and create a border tile at the right and the left side each time the loop is executed. When we go back to Unity, we need to assign the script we created to a game object. Then we want to assign x size and y size equal to 10 and also drag and drop the cube we created earlier into the block field of our script. When we now start the scene, we can see the grid our script created. 
We now want to define the snake itself, which contains out of a head and a tail. For our head, we create a game object variable called head. And we also want to use different materials or colors for the head and the tail. So we create a material variable called head material and one tail material. Then we define a list of game objects named tail, which will contain all tiles of the snake, excluding the head. Now we are going to create a method called create player, where we create a head by instantiating or cloning our block. And we also need to assign the head material to the material of the mesh renderer of this game object. So the head will have a different color than the other blocks we are using. So for example, our border blocks. And we also create a new list of game objects and assign that to our variable tail. We also want to call this method create player in the start method, which is called by Unity. And when the game starts, there should be some food which our snake can collect. For that reason, we create a method spawn food. In this method, we want to determine a vector to spawn pos, which will be returned by a method get random pos, which we will create soon. Then we use a while loop and check if the spawn pos is inside of the snake by calling another method contained in snake, which we will create soon as well. In case the position is inside of the snake, we want to get a new spawn pos, and we do that until we have a spawn pos, which is not contained inside of the snake, and which is a valid position for food we can spawn. Now we are going to create a method get random pos, which returns a vector two. We use the function random.range here to get a position inside of the player grid. Random.range takes two arguments to define a range of numbers from which one is sort of randomly picked. The first value is inclusive and the second one is exclusive. For our x component, we want to get a value between minus x size divided by 2 plus 1 and x size divided by 2 minus 1. Because the second parameter of the function will never be returned, we use x size divided by 2 here. For the y value, we are doing the same, but using the y size variable instead of the x size variable. Next, we create the method contained in snake, which takes a vector to spawn pos as an argument, and we return true whenever the spawn pos lays inside of the snake. To check if the spawn pos lays inside of the snake, we want to check if the spawn pos is inside our head or tail. We check that for the head by comparing the spawn pos x and y component with our x and y component of the head. And then we create a for each loop to go over each tail in our tail list and check if x and y coordinates of spawn pos are identical to the coordinates of the currently picked tail piece. And if that's the case, we are setting the isInTail variable to true. Finally, we return true whenever either isInHead or isInTail is true. Sorry, I just recognized that I have a typo inside of the spawn food method in the contained in snake method name. And back in our method spawn food, we now should have a valid vector to spawn pos, which we can use to spawn some food. To do this, we create a game object called food and assign a newly instantiated or cloned block to it. After this, we use the x and y component of our spawn pos vector and assign this to the position of the transform component of our food game object. After doing all that stuff in the start method of Unity, we want to just disable the initial block we created in Unity because that's not necessary. We have created a border, we have created a head, we have created food, and we don't need the initial block anymore, and it should not be displayed in the game. Now we want to add movement to our snake. First, we define a vector 2 called deer, which contains the movement direction of the snake. We initially assign vector 2.right to it, and then in our game loop or in the update method, which is called once per frame, we want to use the method input.getKey to check if the arrow keys are currently pressed. The method input.getKey takes one argument, which is from type key code. We first check if the arrow down was pressed by using key code dot down arrow. If this is the case, we assign vector 2 dot down to our variable deer. We also check if arrow up, arrow right, or arrow left is pressed. And if this is the case, we assign a proper vector 2 to our deer variable. Now we introduce two float variables called past time and time between movements to realize our movement in certain time intervals. 
We initially assign 0 0.5 to time between movements in the start method because we want to make one movement each half second. Then in our update method, we add time.delta time, which is the time it took to render this frame and add this value to our pass time variable. Next, we check if time between movements is smaller than pass times. If this is the case, it's time to make a movement. So the first thing we want to do is to get the new position which we can find out by taking the current position of the head of our snake and add the deer.x and deer.y component of our deer vector to it. Now it's important to check if the snake collides with something. It could either collide with itself, a tile from the tail, or with the border. To check if the snake collides with the border, we check if the new position dot x and new position dot y coordinates are in the range of our grid by comparing it with our x size and y size variables. To check if the head of our snake will collide with a tail tile, we use a for each loop to go through each tail game object in our list and check if the position of this tail tile is equal to the vector new position. If this is the case, we know that there are in collision and the game is over. We will implement a proper game over logic later. If we are still alive, we finally want to make a movement. And when we only have a head and no tail, the movement is really easy and we can just assign the new position vector to the position of the transform component of our head game object. If we also have a tail, then we do a little trick. So don't actually, we don't actually need to move the whole snake, but what we can do instead is we taking the last tail tile and set it to the new head position. You could think a little bit about it, but it's actually that simple and efficient. To do this, we first assign the tail material to the material of the actual head game object because this is going to be part of the tail right now. Then we add the head game object to our list of tail game objects and take the last element from our tail which we assign as our new head. Finally, we want to assign the head material to the material of our new head and remove the tile we have declared as our new head out of the tail list. Now we can assign the vector new position to the position of the transform component of our new head game object. And that's a movement. Now we have a moving snake and some food which we have spawned, which is pretty nice, but that's not all. What's missing is the collision detection when the snake hits the food. We add this check to our update method or to the game loop and check if the new position dot x and y component are equal to the x and y component of the food position. If this is the case, we know that our snake collides with some food and else we want to make the movement we have already implemented. If the snake collides with the food, we want to instantiate a new tile and set that one active. Because when you remember, we have disabled the block game object we cloned at the end of our start method. And the new tile position is simply the position of our food. Because the snake has consumed that food, we use Unity's destroy immediate function to destroy this game object. Our new tile is going to be the new head of our snake. So at first we want to assign the tail material to our old head game object and add it to our list of tail tiles. Then we want to assign new tile as our new head and apply the head material to its mesh renderer. Later we can add some points here. And when the snake consumed some food, we also want to spawn some new food. So we call the method spawn food again. Inside of the method, we have to do a little adjustment right now because at the end of the start method, we, has, we have disabled the block game object and we want to clone this in the method spawn food. So we want to set the newly instantiated block or our new food game object active. Otherwise, it's not visible in Unity. Now we want to switch back to the Unity editor, assign the head and tail material to the fields in the snake script and execute the game to play run round of snake. Now we also want to have a proper game over logic. To implement this, we introduce a boolean variable called is alive and set it to true in the start method. Then in our update loop, we also want to make a movement in case we are alive and enough time has passed. So we add is alive to our if condition. Where we have 
detected a collision, we want to call a method named game over, which we implement next. It simply should set the boolean is alive to false. Also, we want to show a game over user interface. For that reason, we create a public game object variable called game over UI, which we will assign later in the Unity editor. In our method game over, we then want to set this game over UI game object active so we can see it in our game. The next thing we want to implement is a simple restart function, which we want to trigger from a button in the game over UI window, which we will add soon. In this restart method, we want to reload the scene, which we do by using the method load scene from the scene manager. And because we only have one scene, we use index zero as this argument. To make this work, we also need to import the scene manager in the beginning of our script by using the statement using unity engine dot scene management. We switch then back to the Unity editor in order to create a game over user interface. At first, we need a canvas, which we can create by using the menu game object user interface canvas. Inside of the canvas, we then place an image or a panel and resize it properly. Then we also add a button to it as a child object of the image and place that at the bottom. Finally, we add a text, increase the font size and resize it so that the text will be displayed completely. This is our game over user interface, which we want to disable for now by click the little check mark on the top of the inspector. We then want to assign this user interface to the game over UI field in our snake script. The last thing we want to do is to trigger the restart method we created. When the user click on the button, in our game over user interface. We click on the button in the hierarchy, click on the plus button of the on click event in the inspector, drag and drop the object which contains our snake script into the empty field and then select our restart method from the drop down which appears. The last thing we will implement in this tutorial is a text which shows the user how many points he collected. To do this, we switch back to our code editor, create a text variable called points and import unityengine.ui, which we need in order to work with text in Unity. In our update loop, whenever we collect food, we set points.text equal to points plus tail.count, which is exactly the number of food the snake already consumed, or the number of tail tiles it contains. After this, we need to create this text in the Unity editor, increase the text size, set the position to the top left side of the screen, and we also change the anchor position of this text so it's glued on the top left side on the screen regardless of the screen resolution. In the beginning, the user has not collected any food, so we will add the text points zero. Then we just need to assign the text to our points field in our snake script in the inspector. That's it. Congratulations to your first snake game. You can for sure optimize and adjust the game a lot. You can add more fancy sprites or even use the 3D scene for this game and add some special items which will make you grow faster or slow down the time. We also could think of a feature where you will be faster in case you hold down an arrow key for a certain amount of time. Hope you have enjoyed this tutorial and learned some new stuff. In case you like it, I would really appreciate if you could give this video a like and also subscribe for new tutorials. Thanks for watching and see you soon.